Blessed is our God, Trinity of love, and blessed is the dominion of our God, now and ever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Uh, welcome to you all. It's uh, very good to have you with us this week. Um, we particularly want to welcome Simon Beesey, who is joining us from, um, well, Kilo? Close? Taylor's Lakes? Yes, anyway, <laughs> in that neck of the woods, but here on the screen with us, he is going to be our preacher for this evening. So welcome, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to hearing what you've got to share with us a bit later on. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We claim this time for the worship of God. May God gather us from the four corners of the earth, uniting us as one body in Christ as we lift our voices in praise. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. A light no darkness can distinguish. Since we live as people of the light in faith, hope, and love, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. As we continue this pilgrimage of renewal and repentance, observing a holy Lent through self-examination, prayer, meditation on the scriptures, acts of mercy, fasting, and dedication to the ways of justice and reconciliation, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. With the traditional custodians of this land, the Boonwurrung and the Wurundjeri peoples, and with all whose blood cries out from the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. Joining our voices with the deep groans of creation and with the cries of lament that rise from a world in travail, aching for redemption, 
Let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. With all who suffer with Christ under the weight of the sin of the world, those subjected to injustice and deprivation, those seeking refuge, freedom and peace, especially at this time, the people of Ukraine, as Russia continues to bombard their cities and women and children try to flee to sanctuaries in neighbouring countries. Let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. With what people, with old mama and papa them, with people when sickness oppress, with people when no fit protect themselves from Bege, when no say them need people, make we pray for them. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. with all who serve the earth and its inhabitants, with leaders, policymakers, activists, with workers, students, artists, and storytellers, and especially this week with Yaza as he works as a cleaner, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. each one gathered here in prayer with our absent sisters and brothers, with our neighbours at the Melbourne Indigenous Church Fellowship, and with the whole of Christ Church from the banks of the Birrawan to the ends of the earth. Let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. With God's faithful servants of every time and place, who year by year, generation after generation, have prepared for the celebration of our immersion into the mysteries of Christ's death and resurrection by faithfully observing this season of Lent. And with all whose faithful witness to the truth and commitment to the ways of discipleship have brought a violent persecution and a Christ-like sacrifice of liberty or life. With John the baptizer, Perpetua and Felicitas, Conrad Grebel, Manaki Massimola, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Janani Luvim. Let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. and with the faithful ones whose names we call on now. With these and the whole cloud of witnesses, all who have died in the hope of resurrection, let us pray to the Lord. Into your communion, Lord, gather all creation. Ngozi dirigi, chineke kere inhenile. Ngozi dirikwa unzukonke ipokotaranyi. Dry seeds of hope thirst for life-giving rain. Hard heartlands yearn for a softening shower. The dust and smoke of the parched earth rise up with the prayers of your people. Send your Holy Spirit to call us by name and lead us home. Weary by the heat of hostility, your sun beats back the fires of hell and calls us to follow him on the road to life, on through the charred valley of despair. Send your Holy Spirit to call us by name and lead us home. Days shorten and clouds darken the horizon. Bleached skeleton trees worn of unspeakable death 
and crows keep a knowing eye on our journey. Send your Holy Spirit to call us by name and lead us home. El Señor dice, el ayuno que a mí me agrada consiste en esto, en que rompas las cadenas de la injusticia y desates los nudos que aprietan el yugo, en que dejes libres a los oprimidos, en que compartas tu pan con el hambriento y recibas en tu casa al pobre sin techo. Entonces brillará tu luz como el amanecer y tus heridas sanarán muy pronto. O oh God, you have searched us and you know us. All that we are is open to you. We confess that we are entangled in sin. In your mercy, heal us and set us free. When we avoid examining ourselves, but jump to examine our neighbours. Be merciful, O oh Lord. When we confess you amongst your friends and deny you when your enemies close in. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. When we show great discipline in pursuit of worldly wealth, invest neither energy nor enthusiasm in the treasures of the soul. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. When we clamour for your crown, but refuse to shoulder your cross. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. When we build our comforts and pleasures on the sacrifice of others, instead of sacrificing our privileges to build a world that all can share, be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. When we would rather crucify the prophets than unweave the web of injustice. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. When we demand instant results and scorn those who find value in waiting, in yearning, in suffering, even in dying. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. When we look for an easier gospel, a lighter cross and a less demanding saviour, be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. Be merciful, O oh Lord, for we have sinned. Your thoughts are not our thoughts, merciful God. Neither are your ways our ways. Your ways lead to the wide open spaces of heaven. While left to our own devices, our ways veer off into dead end of hell. But we are here not to have our worst confirmed, but to have our best liberated. Forgive us what is gone wrong, restore us what is wasted, reveal in us what is good. And nourish us with better food than we could ever buy. Your word 
your love, your inspiration, your daily bread for our life's journey in the company of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. No one who believes in Christ will be put to shame. Trust in the power of God that raised Christ from the dead, and you will be set right with God. Confess Jesus Christ as Lord, and you will be saved. Sisters and brothers, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. In our darkness there is no darkness with you, O Lord. The deepest night is clear as the day. In our darkness there is no darkness with you, O Lord. The deepest night is clear as the day. Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we might walk in his footsteps. He did nothing wrong. No false word ever passed his lips. When they cursed him, he returned no curse. Tortured, he made no threats, but trusted the perfect judge. He carried our sins in his body to the cross that we might die to sin and live for justice. When he was wounded, we were healed. Sisters and brothers, no matter the bread we get, we still supposed to follow it in Baba God, the end also. As it be so, make we get sense, follow Baba God, word. Make we careful, no go drop off and waiting to support save us. Lord, to whom shall we go? Yours are the words of eternal life. 神啊，你的奥妙，通过世世代代的人们用智慧显明，刻在神圣之处，记录在圣书里。Send your Holy Spirit to us, that His word may take root in the secret places of our hearts. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Let us listen for the word of God. The Lord your God is giving you the land, and soon you will take ownership of it. Settle down there and plant your crops. When you begin harvesting each crop, you are to take a basketful of the first pickings. And take it to the place chosen by the Lord as a place of worship. You are to present yourself to whoever is the priest at the time, saying, "I am here to give thanks to the Lord our God, for I have put down roots in the land that the Lord promised to our ancestors." Then the priest will accept the basket of produce from you and place it in front of the sacred altar of the Lord. As he does, you are to pray to the Lord in the words of the prayer which tells the story of your people. I am descended from a refugee, an Aramean who settled in Egypt. His family was small when we arrived, but we expanded quickly in numbers and power. We were forced into slavery to keep us in check. The labour was hard and the treatment was harsh. We cried out to you, Lord, God of our ancestors, and you heard our prayers. You saw how we were oppressed and felt the weight of our suffering. You rescued us from the land of slavery, Lord. You broke us free and got us out, with miraculous signs and a terrifying display of strength. You brought us here to this wonderful land, a land of peaches and cream. So now, Lord, I'm here to say thank you. I give you the first of my crops, the pick of all you have given me. After your basket has been placed in front of the altar and you have prayed this prayer, you are to bow down and worship the Lord your God. Then, with your whole community, throw a big party to celebrate and enjoy the good harvest which the Lord God has given you. Don't forget to send an open invitation to share in the celebration 
to the attendants from the place of worship and to any refugees who have settled in the neighbourhood. Hear the word of God. We have heard the silent. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. Let us listen for the word of God. The word that saves is with you. It is on the tip of your tongue. It is beating in your heart. This is the message we've been preaching, and it's all about trust. If you put that trust into words, declaring that Jesus is the one you answer to, and embrace that trust in your heart, believing that Jesus lives because God raised him from the dead, then you will be put back on the right track with God. That's what salvation is. When anyone allows that trust in God to rewrite the basic beliefs they live by, 
their heart is put right with God. And when those rewritten beliefs are expressed openly in what they say and do, then you know that they are safe. in trust for help. As the saying goes, anyone who wants help from God only has to ask. Hear the word of God. We have For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Frères et sœurs, acclamons la justice salvifique de Dieu, attestée par la loi et les prophètes, et maintenant manifesté par la foi en Jésus-Christ pour tous ceux qui croient. Lord, to whom shall we go? Yours are the words of eternal life. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus left the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit was pulsing through him and active in everything he did. At the prompting of the Spirit, Jesus went bush by himself in a remote area. He spent 40 days out there without eating at all, and by the end of that time, he was weak from hunger. During the 40 days, the devil tried every trick in the book to throw him off track. Playing on his hunger, the devil said, if you are really the son of God, prove it. Say the word and turn this rock into a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, as the scriptures say, it takes a lot more than bread to make life worth living. After that, the devil took Jesus up to a lookout with a panoramic view of every nation and state in the whole world. The devil said to him, I can make the world your oyster. I can give you the power to accomplish everything you want everywhere on earth. I've been given power over the whole lot and I can delegate it to whoever I like. All you have to do is worship me. Just acknowledge me as number one and it's all yours. But Jesus was not taken in. He said, the scriptures leave no doubt about who we are to call number one. Worship the Lord your God and no other. Give your wholehearted service to the Lord your God and no other. With that, the devil decided to try quoting scripture too, taking Jesus to Jerusalem and standing him on top of the temple's highest tower. The devil said, if you are really the son of God, prove it to everyone. Throw yourself off the top of this tower so that God can fulfill the scriptures that say, God will instruct the angels to protect you from danger. They will catch you as you fall and you won't so much as stub your toe on the rocks below. But Jesus couldn't be budged. He replied, the scriptures also say, don't go trying to test out the Lord your God. After trying everything to get through Jesus' defences, the devil backed off and laid low, waiting for a weak moment to have another go. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we hear the word of God proclaimed but chaos and clamour compete for our attention. I close my ears to confusion. I close my eyes to enticements. I close my heart to temptations. 
Purge our delusions, O Christ, and let all turmoil within us cease. Engulf me in your passion, embrace me in your darkness, enclose me in your silence. Calm me, my Saviour, as you still the storm. Comfort me, my Redeemer, keep me from destruction. Immerse me, Lord Christ, in the depths of your silence. It is a delight for us to have Simon Beasy with us as our preacher tonight. Um, Simon, Simon is a Baptist pastor, which is kind of how I know him, although I think that actually, Simon, my very first awareness of you was as a musician. I was in a worship event. I can't remember if it was a Baptist Union one or a Whitley College one. Um, and I was just in the congregation and we were singing this song and all of a sudden there was this really hot trumpet solo happened and I'm thinking... Jeez, I haven't actually heard that quality of musicianship in here terribly often. Uh, who's that? <laughs> and it was Simon. <laughs> um, so that was that was my first encounter with you. Um, and Simon, I, I really value the friendship that has blossomed since then. And, and we don't catch up all that often, but it's great when we do. And it's a delight to welcome you here in the Cyber Chapel with us. Yeah. Um, Simon, you work uh, mostly at the moment as a professional funeral celebrant and your um, one kind of previous contact with us, for those who are not aware, is Simon conducted the funeral for Mark, <coughs> for Mark Innes Irons, Rose's son, um, three years ago when I was overseas and, and couldn't do it. Um, Simon, how many funerals have you done? I believe it's some ridiculous amount. Yeah, it's somewhere between 1,100 and 1,200 at the moment, somewhere in there. Not quite sure what it is, but... I think I've done about 20. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Simon, you're also um, a, a husband and dad. Um, yes. tell, us, tell us about your family, how many kids and how old. Right. I met my wife uh, in Adelaide when I was at university. 
destroy the church scene there. She's from uh, Kerrang near Swan Hill in country Victoria. So she went to uh, Kerrang, which uh, is a very strong church in that area. Um, I came from Mildura. Uh, we've, we've been married and got two boys. Uh, one is 18, one is 17. They're finishing, one's finished year 12, one's going to finish this year. Hopefully that's the plan. And uh, yeah, so we're about to, we're hitting that new phase of life where you suddenly discover that you look at, you wake up on Saturday morning and there's no one around and you think, what am I going to do this weekend? So that's, that's our family. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, there's a few uh, geographic connections there because we've got a couple of people in the congregation who are in Adelaide and we've got someone who's yeah. from, grew up in Mildura as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, Simon, really looking forward to what you've got to share with us now. I'm so glad you're not preaching on the passage from Romans because we had a little technical glitch and half <laughs> reading froze and we missed a great chunk of that. And I thought, oh, thank God it's not the one that um, Simon's actually preaching on. So over to you and we look forward to what you've got to share with us now. Well, thank you. Thank you. I was, um, uh, it probably feels a little bit like I'm just going to do a, a return serve on the thank you to Nathan, but I was going to say uh, to all of you about your pastor, I really appreciate the, the help that Nathan's been to me over the years because uh, when I moved to Melbourne, I was in a, in a difficult uh, church setting and I was a pretty green pastor and he's encouraged me through some stuff that I needed, I needed a friend and I needed somebody who could help me through it. So I really appreciate him uh, for what he's, for what he's done for me over the years. So um, just wanted to pass that on as well, but thank you for the invitation to speak here. Uh, this is exciting. Um, we are approaching Easter. So I guess some of you might be focusing on some of those spiritual disciplines that Nathan mentioned earlier because of Lent. Uh, and a lot of the spiritual disciplines, if any of you are going through them, are really wrapped up in this passage uh, that we are looking at today in Luke 4. So there's a bit of solitude in there, there's a bit of prayer in there, there's a bit of fasting in there, all those kinds of things that a lot of people do as spiritual disciplines during this season of the year. And so that's partly why I chose this, uh, this passage in preparation for that, if some of you are going through that about the temptation of Jesus. Um, and so as we read that passage, we realize that what some of you may be doing, Jesus was one of the one of our predecessors in that. And so some of your exercises might even be based on this passage. And so as we look at the temptation that happens to Jesus today, we're focusing on the strategies of the tempter. And I was really interested in hearing the way it was described in the Bible reading that you used in the translation you used. Now, it was every trick in the book. Satan tried every trick in the book. And I thought that's, that's fantastic because that's exactly what we're focusing on today. We're looking at, well, what are the tricks? What are the tricks in the book? Um, and what are some of the really common ones that we can look out for and, and help us in, in our own struggles that we go through? Uh, the Apostle Paul looks at this as well. He looks at in 2 Corinthians, uh, he says that he's writing uh, in order that the Satan might not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes in other words we know what the tricks are so we should look out for the tricks and that'll help us and that's really the basis of what we're going to do today we're going to look at what some of those tricks are now a little bit of housekeeping uh, Nathan has spent some time in the past talking to you as a congregation about how we should refer to the tempter uh, some people view the Satan as as a personal being uh, others as an impersonal being. Uh, I'm not going to get into that today. Nathan's already covered it. Uh, it's not the purpose of our time, but if you want to listen to some of his sermons about it, they're on your website there, and I'm sure he can tell you which ones they are. And, uh, but just to be aware today that uh, when we use the word Satan or the Satan or the devil or the tempter, I'm just going to kind of use them all interchangeably and you'll be able to engage with those in whatever context that you're familiar with in how you think of the tempter. And so in Luke 4, we see Jesus goes out into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness is not a nice place. Uh, if you believe the internet, they've got a monastery built there. This is kind of what it looks like there. Uh, this is generally what people consider of here as the Judean wilderness. This is the place that we're talking about. Uh, it's renowned as one of the most inhospitable places 
on the earth. It's full of scorpions and snakes and wild beasts and there's no water there. And so what a lot of people see is that in the temptation of Jesus, they see a real deliberate contrast to the first temptation that's recorded in the Bible. So if you think about Jesus as the second Adam, which he's referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, then we compare that with the first temptation with the first Adam. Well, Jesus' temptation was in this dry, horrible wilderness, which is the worst of circumstances. The first temptation happened in the opposite circumstances, in a beautiful, lush garden with plenty of water. And what we're trying to look at is the way that the results of those two temptations are just as contrasting as the circumstances. And what we want to notice today is that while the circumstances were very different and the results were very different, the strategy of the tempter was actually very similar. As we look at the strategy of the Satan in Matthew 4 and Luke 4 and Mark 1, and we compare it with what happened in the garden, we can learn some things about the Satan's schemes and the tricks that he's using to try and trap us. And so trick number one, scheme number one, is this. The one thing that you don't have is better than everything God's given you already. And we see this in the temptation of turning the stones to bread. So in this part of the story, when the Satan offers Jesus the bread, Jesus actually had everything he could want at that moment. He had everything he could want, except he was really hungry. He was spiritually full. He was feeling close to God. All those things were lined up and in place. And the Satan was trying to point out that, well, sure, God's given you a lot. You're spiritually full. You're feeling close to God. But don't look at that. Let's turn over here and let's look at the one thing that you don't have, which is food. God is not looking after you properly. And we see the same thing happen in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve. They had the whole garden, everything God had given them. But there was one thing that wasn't given to them. And so the Satan focused on that and offered them the one tree. But they already had the whole garden. They had tons of trees. Why did they need one more? And so this is the scheme. This is the trick to convince us that the one thing we don't have is better than everything we already have, everything that God's given us. And the Satan wants to get us to focus on that one thing and allow that to become everything. Now, that trick, that scheme is, is very similar to the scheme or trick number two. Um, this number two trick is that he tempts us with what we already have. And this is when the Satan promises Jesus that I'll give you the world. He promises something that Jesus already has. Uh, now, the Bible does tell us that the Satan is the prince of the world. So, yes, in one way, if Satan was the prince of the world, then Jesus didn't have it. But Jesus owned the world before the Satan. And he entrusted it to people to look after. But then the Satan got in control of things, didn't he? And you notice in verse 6, it says, it was given to me. The Satan acknowledges that. He says, the world was given to me and I can give it to you. But who gave the world to the Satan? Well, God gave that to the Satan, didn't he? Jesus gave that to the Satan. So what exactly was the Satan trying to offer Jesus? The devil was trying to tempt Jesus with something that he already had and that he got from Jesus in the first place. And we see that also in Genesis chapter 3 with Eve. Uh, the Satan says to Eve, when you eat of the tree, you'll be like God. Well, guess what? She was already like God. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1.27 that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. So she was already like God. But what did the Satan tempt her with? Oh, you need to become like God. 
She was already like God. And that's the second, the second trick of the devil, the second temptation. And this thing often happens to us. Uh, so if we can watch out for it, it can be a little bit helpful. So next time you're feeling tempted with something, try to just, just pause, just stop for a moment and try and search your heart. Look for something that's happening a level deeper underneath the immediate obvious temptation. Just see if you can peel back the curtain a bit, peel back the layers and see what's the deeper motivation or the deeper desire that is giving that temptation its power. You'll probably notice that the thing you're being tempted with, something you've already got, but it's disguised in a different way. I'll give you an example of it uh, for me. Uh, if I'm getting frustrated or angry at home, uh, usually it's because I want some peace and quiet. I want some peace and quiet, I feel like I'm not getting it. And so I get frustrated and I get angry because this is my rest time. I want to watch the footy or something like that. And I get upset if the kids are disturbing me, particularly when they were younger. But the reality is that if I wasn't making a scene right now, the noise would have probably disappeared already. And I would have the peace and quiet that I wanted that I'm now angry about and I'm making a fuss about so there's no peace and quiet for anybody. And so if we look at that situation and look a little deeper into it, I don't actually crave quietness. I'm getting upset because it's not quiet, but I don't crave quietness. What I really crave is happiness. And happiness was already happening, wasn't it? The noise that the kids were making, that was them being happy. They were having a great time playing the Xbox or running around outside or running into the room playing hide and seek or whatever they were doing. They were happy. And as a father, that should make me happy. But the trick is that I find that I don't have something that I want, which I'm calling peace. What I really wanted was happiness, which I had all along. And so we get tempted with something that we already have. And so we've got to watch out for that kind of thing. All of us do. And so then trick number three, scheme number three, is really focused on our pride. This is where the Satan says to Jesus, jump off the pinnacle. Uh, now, something that we don't always know and notice is that uh, this temptation, that this challenge to jump off the pinnacle was something that a, a previous Messiah had done and jumped off and landed on the ground and went flat. And that was the end of his attempts to be the Messiah. And so uh, this is something which was kind of common knowledge at the time. And so the Satan is saying, well, you would actually be successful, Jesus. And it, it's, it's an attack on his pride. And he says, starts out by trying to create a bit of doubt in Jesus. And he says, if you are the son of God, you'll be able to jump off here and God will take care of you and it'll all be all right. The Satan starts this scheme by trying to create doubt where there is no doubt. We've got to watch out for that too. And if you look at it, does the Satan think that Jesus has forgotten who he is? If you are the son of God, why does Jesus need to prove himself to anyone? He doesn't. Now, obviously in the story in the Bible, Jesus doesn't fall for it. But we do. We fall for it all the time. I've got a friend who's got a kid who, when that friend was a teenager, one of the little games this guy played for about three months is when he would come over to visit my kids, he'd say something really ridiculous like, you know, if you dip the knife in the butter, some butter will come out. And he'll say, Pro he would say, prove it. Or if, if you said anything just really obvious, like if you open the fridge, there'll be, you know, your lunch in there. And he wouldn't do it. He'd just say, prove it. And he'd kind of antagonize you and try and get you to, to get in this debate with him to prove something that there was no need to prove. And that's kind of what Satan's doing here. The Satan's saying, well, prove, prove this thing and there's no need to prove it. And we often fall for that. Often our anger or our frustration or our impatience or many of our wrong attitudes come from trying to prove ourselves to others, to ourselves, to anyone. 
Why do we have to prove ourselves to anyone, especially the tempter? And so when we try to prove ourselves, instead of resting in God, being at peace in his love, the end result is anger and frustration and pride in trying to prove ourselves. And as we were going through some of your rituals today, I was just wondering if that was the point of one of them, where it's saying you're forgiven, just rest in that and be at peace in that. I think that's exactly what that little ritual was trying to reassure us all of as you went over and over and over again with every individual person. It's actually combating this temptation of the devil to prove yourselves. We don't have to. We just rest in what we've been forgiven from. Something that we do know, and psychologists will tell us that our anger is often fear in disguise. When people struggle with emotions like anger and some other things like that, psychologists will often begin by helping them look for things they're afraid of. Because if you can figure out what you're afraid of, you can figure out where your anger comes from. And the Satan wants to make us afraid. How does the tempter make us afraid? He starts by saying, if. If this, and as soon as we listen to if, we get afraid. If God loves you, if God cares, if God's in control, if God is true and trustworthy. And it's the same in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.1. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The tempter tries to sow these seeds of doubt and then spots a weakness and then works on that weakness and makes the weakness grow. And with Eve, the weakness was that the tempter tried to work on the way that she said God forbade them to touch the tree. Why would she say that? Well, maybe there was a little bit of fear in there. And so the Satan works on the fear and expands on it to create more fear and more doubt. Because God didn't say don't touch the tree. God said don't eat the tree. But maybe there was a bit of fear. So, well, let's not touch the tree. And that little doubt is what the tempter works on. And then the tempter's task is nearly complete, just works on that and can sit back and watch what the fear does. So these three common traps of the Satan, what is the answer to them? Well, the answer to all of these schemes is to keep our hearts and our eyes focused on God. Uh, all the schemes focus on our insecurities. And so it's very interesting and important to notice something that happens right before the temptation of Jesus. The temptation happens in chapter 4, but look at what happens in chapter 3. Just before the temptation is the baptism. And in the baptism, you'll notice there's a really strong and a really wonderful affirmation of Jesus. In the baptism, God says to Jesus, you are my son who I love. With you, I am well pleased. That affirmation is so important right before a temptation. Personally, I know that I'm the most vulnerable to temptation when I'm feeling bad about myself. It's a very common thing. If you watch your own emotions and practice for a while, you'll probably notice something similar happening in yourself. It talks about how many Christians struggle with temptation uh, because we don't enjoy life as much as God wants us to. And uh, interestingly, the people, people that are um, accused of that the most are the Baptists, which is kind of us, right? <laughs> but this writer, he talks about the verse that says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. He says the key is that we are going to be tempted when we're unhappy. That's why the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so he says, we must arrange our lives so that sin no longer looks good to us. And he writes about this in a, in a book on spiritual disciplines. And he's looking at fasting and solitude and all these kinds of tough disciplines. And then he has a chapter on this spiritual discipline that he calls celebration. The discipline of having fun, because that helps you resist sin better. Why are we stronger when we're joyful? Well, because if we're already having a good time, sin doesn't look as attractive to us. If you're having a fantastic time doing the right thing, you won't have a great desire to do the wrong thing. And that's one of the reasons why the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
We need to arrange life so that sin no longer looks good to us. So what we find is that all of the strategies of the tempter that we looked at today are about taking away our joy. The tempter wants us to feel sad when we focus on the one thing that we don't have instead of all the wonderful things that God's already given to us. The tempter wants us to feel tired and unmotivated when we struggle and struggle and struggle to gain what we already had anyway. And the tempter wants to make us afraid when doubt starts to cloud our minds, which leads to all kinds of self-doubt and weakness after that. And so we need to focus on and be thankful for and enjoy to the fullest the wonderful gifts that God's already given us. And we need to focus on what God says about us, not worry about what others say about us or worry about our own self-doubt. And if we can do that, well, then we're well on the way to following Jesus' footsteps in defending, in defeating temptation and living the kinds of fuller and more joyful lives that he intends for us. And so that's what I think we learn from this passage that you've looked at today in your reading leading into Lent. So hopefully that's a little bit helpful to you. And I'm going to hand back to Nathan to continue with the rest of your service. But thank you for the privilege of speaking here today. I'm glad to be asked. So thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. That was indeed very helpful. Um, really bringing that message home and, and enabling us to see how it plays out in our lives as well. So we're very much in your debt. Thank you. Let us now affirm the faith of the church. We believe in God, creator of all that is and shall be, redeemer of all that is less than it could be, sustainer of our living, our loving, our being. We believe in the cross of Christ, drenched in hatred and cruelty, yet overflowing with God's unquenchable love. We believe in the bread of life, Broken and shared, it opens our eyes to the presence of Christ and strengthens us for the journey. We believe in the pain suffered by Christ, all our hurts, torments and betrayals, magnified in the purity of love and embraced that we might be free. We believe in the joy of the Holy Spirit, poured into the hearts of those who with courage and resolve refuse to trade integrity for popularity. We believe in the gospel, good news offered to us in Jesus, despised by the world, but leading us in the way of life. We believe in love, the nature of God, a gift unsurpassed, but a mystery only fulfilled when everything else is relinquished. We believe in light shining from darkness, in mercy vanquishing bitterness, in life bursting free where death reigned. How then shall we live? How shall this faith take flesh in the world? The cross? We will take it. Bread? We will break it. The pain? We will bear it. The joy? We will share it. The gospel? We will live it. The love? We will give it. The light? We will cherish it. The darkness. God shall perish it. Perish it. Kaskana Hamilia, and the Aibo, Pisosma. Ajo, the deal of Bahira, Bosom. In Abane, Sir Gorman, Janum Bahira, Promesur Ka, Putra, Yeshune Hamra. Man Pardam Pujari Huncha. By God's grace, we share in Christ's priesthood, praying for the world day and night, until earth and heaven are reconciled, and all things are made one in Christ. That we may remain humble in our preparation for the blessings of the Paschal celebration, let us pray to the Lord.
celebration for the feast of Christ's resurrection may change our hearts, empowering us to love even the least. Let us pray to the Lord. that we may treasure the word spoken into our hearts, learning to understand and live it out. Let us pray to the Lord. that we may learn to know Jesus who came to save all who are gripped by greed and fear. Let us pray to the Lord. we may face our sin in truth and humility. Let us pray to the Lord. That we may turn from evil and embrace the good. Let us pray to the Lord. That the world might be healed of its grievous wounds, that wars would cease, poverty, corruption and bigotry be eradicated and fear, disease, and despair be overcome. Let us pray to the Lord. That vulnerable and underdeveloped nations might receive the aid and expertise they need to survive both old dangers and new, and emerge strong, healthy and free. Let us pray to the Lord. <laughs> That those families and communities torn apart by acts of war, whether legal or criminal, might find justice, peace and healing. Let us pray to the Lord. <laughs> that we might honour the First Nations of this land, seeking justice and reconciliation together and taking to heart their wisdom for how to live in this land with respect and sensitivity, let us pray to the Lord. <laughs> that the most vulnerable in our society, including those without secure housing or work, those suffering illness, trauma or disability, and those seeking asylum on our shores, might be given welcome, support and hope. Let us pray to the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. 
all whom we carry in our hearts from around our world, around our nation, and among our loved ones might be gathered into our prayers. Let us lift up to God the names of those for whom we would especially seek God's care. que podamos aprender a orar de la manera en que nuestro Salvador lo ha hecho. Por lo mismo, recemos como Él nos lo ha enseñado. from evil, Lord God, for we put our trust in your promise that the ancient deceiver of your people would be vanquished on the cross of your son. And so we ask you, crush the power of demonic lies in the hearts of your people. Protect us from the sin that so easily entangles. We ask to run with per perseverance the race you have set before us, looking only to Jesus as the origin and goal of our faith. Enfold all your people in mercy, Lord God, and strengthen us for the journey ahead. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We stand at the threshold of the ultimate feast, when all who hunger will be fed, and the new wine of justice will be poured. And even now, Christ invites us to his table to taste the first fruits and be nourished for the journey. Whosoever will may come, not because you are worthy, nor because any church gives permission, but simply because Jesus offers himself to you and you want to offer yourself in return. Come. Let us prepare the Lord's table, offering the gifts that we are and the gifts that we bring. Bendito seas tú, Dios, Señor de toda la creación. A través de tu bondad, tenemos comunión entre nosotros y con todos quienes esperan en Cristo Jesús. Have peace with one another. The peace of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. 亲爱的神，全世界的缔造者，生命之水的河流从你流出
，因你的恩惠，我们才能分享这酒、植物的果实、人类的劳动成果。We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. Let us lift up our heart. We lift it to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God, for you put your saving word on our lips and in our hearts, and strengthen us to endure in times of trial. You created the world in all its glory and called forth crops from the ground. When your people were oppressed and enslaved, you reached out to your hand to save them and gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. You sent your Son Jesus Christ as the first fruits of a harvest of righteousness. He stood firm against the devil's temptations, trusting instead in your saving word. And offering his worship and service to you alone, when the forces of evil cast him into the grave, you raised him from the dead and made him Lord of all. Now you save all who trust him and confess him as Lord in word and deed. Yeah, Mary. No one will be able to bring you to my Lord, my Mary, my Lord. We sing to you. With all the angels and archangels who envelop us, with all the saints before us and beside us, with brothers and sisters, east and west, north and south, we sing to you. We sing to you. Ra ra piya jan ka saar, awa hami bata lok jo aaj aje yes rasham hamro najik chan. We sing the hymn of an empty grace. Holy, 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 God of truth and love, heaven and earth are full of your glory. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. 神圣的仁慈的主和你神圣的儿子耶稣基督，他把自己的血肉给我们吃。使我们永远的存在在他的生命里，他也永远的存在在我们的生命里。Consuming him and consumed by him, we are thus strengthened to walk in his footsteps, even knowing that to do so will inflame the fury of hell. We bless you for Christ, who has gone on before us, enduring the cross and disregarding its shame, to open a new trail for all to follow—a trail of justice and liberating peace, which presses on through suffering and beyond, all the way to the banqueting room of heaven. Blessed is our brother Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Who, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, "This is my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me." In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, "This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it to remember me." 
Alors, toutes les fois que nous mangeons ce pain et buvons cette coupe, nous annonçons le mystère de notre foi. Therefore, here in this place, we celebrate the life that death could not hold, the life that Jesus has shared among his community through the centuries and shares with us now. Habiendo sido hechos uno con él y por tanto entre nosotros mismos, ponemos ante su presencia estos regalos de pan y vino, como señal de nuestro sacrificio de alabanza y de agradecimiento pues aquí nos presentamos a nosotros mismos, así como nuestros cuerpos, mente y espíritu, para constituir un sacrificio continuo y santo para ti, Señor. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and brood over these bodily things, this bread and this wine. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ, healing, renewing and making us whole. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and embrace us with your life-giving power, that as bread and wine are made one with us, we may become one with you, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and make of your gathered people the real presence of Christ for the world, living our prayer and praying our life, till earth and heaven are reconciled, and all are free as Christ is free. Glory be to you. given for the life of the world. Holy things for holy people. Only one is holy, one is holy, Jesus Christ. In him and him and him and him alone is made holy to the glory Let us receive what we are. Let us become what we receive. The, the body, body of Christ. Christ. Jesus, the wellspring of life, invites all who are thirsty to come to him. So come, receive freely. Let us raise our cups as one and taste the first fruits of the coming joy. 
the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life until he comes. Lord Christ, you have called us to follow wherever the road of discipleship leads. In baptism, you secured our destiny, and in bread and wine, you feed us for the journey. Go before us now on the narrow way that leads to life. When the marketers offer everything, if only we have the money and you offer everything, if only we will do without. I will take up my cross and follow you. When the easier way to succeed means we lose our integrity, but the harder way means we lose our pride. I will take up my cross and follow you. When the church wants us to conform and be nice, and you want us to rebel and be real, I will take up my cross and follow you. When our friends don't respect what we count as important and we feel like giving in to save face. I will take up my cross and follow you. When friendships are easy and light, without commitment or vulnerability, and learning to love one another deeply means stretching far beyond the bounds of comfort, I will take up my cross and follow you, glorious and blessed God, creator, redeemer and sustainer, wherever you go and wherever you lead, I will follow in faith and hope, relying for strength on you alone. Amen. None of us has the strength alone to live the prayer we have prayed, but with the Holy Spirit to unify and empower us, we can grow into our prayer. The Lord says, if you want to be with me, take up your cross and follow me. If you want to save your own life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for me and for the gospel, you will gain it. I assure you, there are some here who will not die until they have seen the kingdom of God. Go now, confessing Christ as Lord in word and deed. Worship and serve the Lord your God and no other. Stand firm in the time of trial. Tell the story of God's goodness and trust in the Lord whose saving word is always with you. And may God instruct angels to guard you wherever you go. May Christ Jesus be your refuge and stronghold. And may the Holy Spirit lead you and put God's word on your lips and in your hearts. Sisters and brothers, the Eucharist never ends, it must be lived. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen. Amen.